Okay. Let's start again. Uh, as you probably are aware of, there is uh, another economics course following this one up, okay, and then it will be much more focused on on uh, the leisure industry. So this is kind of just, in principle, trying to be a building block. You, you really need to be able to understand that course. Now, we have finished chapter four, and uh, according to the curriculum, uh, there is no uh, chapter five. The reason is that uh, chapter 5 is related to, uh, what was the topic? Yeah, chapter 5 is about uncertainty and consumer behavior. So then you kind of look at um, the so-called von neumann morgenstein utility concept, which is kind of different. Uh, at some point it may be necessary in the accompanying course, but uh, I think it's kind of of lesser interest, so we, we don't need to expose you to it. If you're interested, interested of course, you can read it yourself. It's, uh, it's about lotteries, basically, how, how people trade risk against certainty. Okay. So now we move into Chapter 6, which has the title of Production. So now we leave the consumer and move into the producer. Okay, the two groups that uh, interest us in this course mainly. Yeah, chapter six, production. Let's start by discussing the typical production decisions of a firm. Obviously, a firm needs to make decisions on production technology. Okay, you need to decide on whether it should be human beings or machines or combinations or whatever. Okay, that's uh, we are kind of everybody aware of that. Uh, for a football team, they need to decide whether to have artificial grass or uh, what's the other name? Non-artificial grass, real grass. Uh, so there is some decisions that cannot be must be taken in order to define what kind of technology you really need. And as it says here, we need a practical, uh, in this case meaning mathematically convenient way of describing how inputs, and in this case uh, we make a very simplified uh, definition of what inputs into production is. And inputs in our sense is uh, a two-dimensional set of variables, labor, and capital, basically. It also says raw materials here. But of course, if you have cap capital, you can buy raw materials. So we can kind of think of the basic input into a production process as human beings and money. Okay, That would kind of be necessary to produce anything. You know, basically, money is enough, isn't it? <laughs> In principle. Okay, If you have money, you can buy people. So, But uh, for uh, historical reasons, we kind of uh, stick to this labor and capital definition of the inputs into a production process. Of course there is some cost constraints here. This uh, input costs money, so we need to take that into consideration. Okay, if we, we can't kind of spend too much costs here uh, without thinking about relating it to the revenues. So there is some link here we need to, to handle. Uh, and uh, there is some input choices here, given production technology, decisions on what input combinations to choose must be made. Okay, how many people should we hire? What kind of people should we hire? What kind of machines should we buy, if any? How much salary should we give to the people? There are obviously an enormous amount of decisions any producer must make. In microeconomics, we do this extremely easy. Okay, we assume that the so-called production function exists, and the production function, as it says here, shows the maximal amount of output given various choices of K, which is capital, and L, which is labor. So we assume we can kind of find some 
mathematical description of how our firm works. So we input two streams of inputs here. We put capital into this weird function and we also put labor into it and out comes our product in units. It, as it says here, it's a gravely simplified theoretical description of all firms. As you probably know, this school is interested in logistics and logistics as a science deals with far more advanced and detailed descriptions of this production function. If you think about um, some kind of mechanical production system, you know you have certain machines and people must operate these machines and it could be a question on how you should organize this. Should you start with machine A then move to machine B or should you maybe take machine C first and this is some kind of decisions that are, are relevant in in uh, logistics, often referred to as sequencing, by the way, how to sequence production lines. Of course, in event production, uh, we perhaps do not have such a focus on the technological side. It's more like the labor itself that's important here and kind of mix that labor in the right way, get the right actors for a play, get the right musicians for a concert, making them uh, behave, being sober and being able to perform and that kind of stuff. Well obviously this is not necessarily that easy, but uh, but uh, you have the same kind of problem, okay? You, you, you put something into some kind of uh, abstract mechanism and out comes your output. A football team produces football matches, A concert arranger produces concerts. Obviously, the more labor and capital you put into this structure, the more concerts you get. Okay, Even at least we would accept expect that. It says at the bottom here that this production function describes technical feasibility for a given technology. So we kind of assume we have a certain technology here, and given that technology. Uh, we assume that we can kind of describe what happens here through this extremely simplified way of doing it. Uh, but we, we kind of need these constructs to, to make our theory on the production side work, even though of course we can criticize it for being too, too simplified. Now in microeconomics, especially on the production side, we, we often make a distinction between the so-called short run and the long run. The title should indicate that this has something to do with time, and to some extent it has, but uh, the definition here should perhaps lead us elsewhere. The short run, it says here, is a period in time where one or more of production factors or inputs cannot be changed. Okay, so in the short run we allow ourselves to fix some of the input factors. In this case, the input factors is capital and labor, so it may be that we may look at what happens if capital, for instance, is fixed or if labor is fixed. In the long run, all production factors can be changed. So this short and long run is kind of related to the, the type of decisions we make. Keeping one or several of the decisions fixed and then letting one or several others change. So in principle, it's no specific time period. We don't say the short run is one year or six months or whatever. It's related to how we view our decision problems. Or as it says here, a description-dependent time definition. It, the, the time definition kind of depends on what decisions we're interested in examining or analyzing. So basically, we, we can think of the short-run situation as a situation which is even more simplified than the long-run situation, because we fix certain of our variables. Okay. What might a production function look like? Now we look at a short-run case where K, capital, is fixed, while labor varies. Okay. And if you look on the top here, there is a certain function. It has a certain shape. 
and hopefully this shape is sensible. That's the idea here. Now if you look here, multi-measure here is of course output in a certain given time period is per month and then we kind of vary our labor. So in certain situations we have few people engaged in our business and then we add more people to kind of see what's happening when we move along these axes. And the idea here is as it should be perhaps that when we enter more labor into our production function then we get more output. That is the whole idea of engaging more people, isn't it? To be able to produce more. And it's increasing here. It has a kind of shape which makes it progressively increasing. It's in increasing faster and faster as we move up here. But then suddenly it comes to a point C here where it's still increasing. We get more when we hire more, but it starts to be de degressive, if you like. This has to do with the second derivative, by the way. So, and then at a certain point here, the D point, it's no, no use to put more people into it, is it? You can think about the ditch. People should dig a ditch of a certain length, let's say 10 meters. Of course, if you put one people, one man down, he starts digging, it takes a certain amount of time to produce the ditch. Two, mount, two people down there, it gets faster, it starts start from each side, three people and so on. But at a certain point, adding more people won't help. It actually has the opposite effect because it gets far too crowded down this ditch. Okay? This is kind of the logic underlying this way of viewing a production function. The law of diminishing marginal returns. When there are too many workers, some workers become ineffective and the marginal product of labor, sorry not if, of labor falls. The marginal product is of course the derivative of this function, which is plotted here. So if you take the derivative of this shape of a function, you will get a function which looks like this. Of course we can do we can show this mathematically and we will do this in exercises. Okay. The point here is that at this B point, this is what's happening here. Then the marginal product starts to fall. Okay, and of course at this point becomes negative. Okay, you don't you get less production by adding more people. So you can either do the argument directly here, or maybe it's easier to see it here because you get a very strong situation. <laughs> obvious thing. It starts, it grows here, but then it goes down. At this point, it gets negative. That's the meaning of the the B point here, where this function moves from being progressive into being degressive, and at this point, it boils on the opposite side. So this is kind of a basic way of thinking of these production functions. They should kind of look like this. Now if you think about the football team, is this a reasonable description of, if we think about labor, buying more football players? Do we reach this kind of situation? We don't, don't we? Because we don't need to use them, okay? <laughs> if we buy them, we can just have them there. And we, we kind of never, there's always 11 people on the football team, so it, this is kind of special in that situation, isn't it? If we stage a musical, would we reach that situation then? Engaging more singers and actors? Again, we can kind of decide on whether to use them. Of course, if we put all on the stage, then we could reach that situation, couldn't we? If the idea is to have some kind of coordinated dance, and if you put too many dancers on the stage, the stage becomes too small. Maybe it's hard to perform the dance, and it's not as nice as it could be. So in that situation, this could very well happen. But of course, in most of these sports structures where you have kind of given numbers, you kind of can't exceed that number anyway. So it, you don't get the same kind of situation. But I assume you understand what I mean here. <coughs> The concept of the average product is also plotted here. This, this is just this function divided by uh, the quantity by Q, I think. But we'll re return to that later on. It's, uh, the most important thing to, to kind of grasp here is that at least if you think about normal manufacturing, producing products, you should expect this to happen, okay? 
when you kind of enter more people it's, it's positive, posi it's extremely positive but at some point it starts to being less positive and the, the more you put in now the, the less positive it becomes so to speak and at a certain point it starts getting ne negative and it's easy to kind of see this by computing the marginal product which is just the derivative of this production function so okay we have the production function we can compute the derivative we have a name for it we call it the marginal product in all economic theory if you put marginal in front of some concept it means the derivative we have marginal costs don't we that's the derivative of cost functions we can have marginal profits the derivative of the profit function we can have marginal products like in this case there are all kinds of marginal concepts but they are easy in the sense that marginal just means the derivative okay any questions? Yeah. No, it shouldn't be hard. And of course, there's a table here which kind of, by numbers, tries to explain all here. We have fixed the amount of capital, okay? The short term case, K is fixed, okay? So that is kept at 10. And then the amount of labor here, 0, 1, 2, and so on. And then we have these values, total output, 0, 10, which kind of corresponds to this pattern here. You see it's actually going down from 108 down to 100 at the bottom here. 112 to 108, and so we have a point here around 112. So these are the numbers underlying this graph. Okay? And then you have the average product here, which is actually defined here by taking this one and divide by L. So you divide by the amount of labor to kind of get the average amount of production you get out of each worker given various numbers for this, uh, this resource. So that is how this function has been computed. You just simply base it on this one and divide by L. The marginal product, as it says here, is the change in Q divided by the change in L. So you just have to, to find this 10. It's 10 minus 0 divided by 1 minus 0, which is 1, and 10 over 1 is 10. Okay, so you see how you can compute it numerically based on the numbers here. Of course, when we deal mathematically with this, if that is the point, then we need some kind of mathematical specification for this function. And as you, if you see the function, how it behaves, it's kind of more complex than what we have been used to. It has a top point, there are some change points here, so it, it has to be kind of more complex than just square functions or linear functions. It's uh, highly nonlinear and it, it needs a special structure to kind of embrace these, these, these thoughts underlying what it should mean. Okay, technological change. Now remember, when we thought about this production function, we kind of thought of it for a given technology. But of course technology changes, okay? Ch technology improves. Computers become faster, faster, cell phones get bigger screens and so on. So there is changes in how technology is, normally to the better. So here is an example on how we can view this given that we have technological change and then we can of course think about different production functions under different technologies. Labor productivity or output per unit of labor can increase if there are improvements in technology, that's kind of obvious. Okay. Even though any given production process exhibits diminishing returns to labor, meaning that you have this structure here. As we move from point A on O to B on curve O to C on curve O, or O1, oh, oh, it's a, a printer, it's O1, O2, O3. The labor productivity increases. So if you move from one technology to another, you can kind of get the, get the 
steadily, steadily increasing function here, so it doesn't have to kind of end up like this in the real world if you, s if you see this over a certain amount of time. You see my point? Uh, you can think like this, okay, we start in with one production technology here, and then we decide, okay, we end up here, and then we change the technology. Even if we then stick to the same amount of labor, we may still increase. So you can keep on increasing here if technology changes as, as we are kind of used to. But mostly we, we kind of don't look at these dynamically, okay? We kind of look at a given situation where we have a certain technology. Of course, we know that technology improves, but uh, we, we normally don't input that into our analysis, as we will see later on. Of course, again, an approximation or a simplification, if you like. Now, here is... Uh, a long run situation where we actually look at two variable inputs. Okay, now we allow both capital and labor to vary. And then we can kind of construct something which is similar to the indifference curves we looked at in the chapters three and four. It doesn't it isn't name named indifference curves here. Here it's called isoquant. So isoquant is a combination of K and L, capital and labor producing the same output. Now it's not the same utility, it's the same output. This is kind of just following up what we did in these previous chapters on the production side, similarly as we did on the demand side. So these isoquants can kind of be curves, for instance, looking like this. And the idea then is that if you move along such an isoquant, the amount of output here is the same. It's hard to see here, actually. It was a bad copy. But uh, in the middle here, it says uh, an output of 75. Here it's uh, something. Yeah, I, I really can't read it. Plays the same role as in different curves and or maps in consumer theory. <laughs> you see that the underlying data to the figure on the right-hand side in this table 6.4 on the left. So it's a kind of just similar. The idea is perhaps that we, sh that we should solve some optimization problems in the end here. If you kind of think through what we did in the previous chapter, we may need this to find some optimal choices at certain points. And the idea is perhaps to find the optimal choices of K and L here. Who knows? We will see. Okay, This is just preparation. Just like what we did in chapter 4, we can kind of think of extremes here. So we can have uh, what is referred to as an isoquant when inputs are perfect substitutes or straight lines, like when products are perfect substitutes in the consumer case. And then we can have what is referred to as fixed proportions production functions. That means basically that you have to, to be able to produce more you can't just increase one of the inputs. You have to increase the other input in the same manner. So you need one person and 100 crones, another person and another 100 crones. Okay, this is what this represents. So here you can, can kind of substitute freely. You can either choose to hire people or put some money into the process. Again, similarly like in, in uh, consumer theory. <coughs> And then we can talk about some concepts which may be necessary or not necessary to, to know about. It's referred to as returns to scale. And then we have something which we refer to as increasing returns to scale. And that is defined underneath here. If output more than doubles, then input is doubled. Okay, So if you have a certain amount of L here and K here, and you double both, 2L and 2K, then you get more than double out. Okay, so you have a progressive structure of your production function. Constant returns to scale means that output doubles when input doubles. Okay, then there's a kind of a certain inbound linearity, if you like. And of course, the third option here is that you have decreasing returns to scale, output less than doubles when input doubles. These are just terms, okay? 
So if somebody talks about this, okay, now you know what it means. Okay, this is just a definition, if you like. This is what we mean by these concepts of increasing returns to scale, constant returns to scale, and decreasing returns to scale. Then we can, for instance, talk about the constant returns to scale production function. That would be a linear function, wouldn't it? If I double something here, I get double back. But if it looks like this, then I have increasing returns to scale. If it looks like this, I have decreasing returns to scale. It less than doubles if you double the input side here. Of course, the production functions we looked at had all these elements at the same time, didn't it? Here we have increasing returns to scale. Here we have de decreasing returns to scale. Uh, maybe at some point here there is linearity, so there is kind of constant returns to scale. Okay. Okay, that was chapter six. That was a quick chapter. Do we have any questions? No, we kind of uh, capitalize on the fact that we know something about the previous chapters here, okay? So I don't spend the same amount of time on these, these matters. Okay, we haven't finished, or have we finished? We, have, we have still have some time left, so let's move to the next chapter. That's chapter 7. Now we are kind of moving into more, uh, slightly more complex stuff, and now we kind of look for these optimization problems that the producer could be interested in solving. So the chapter objective here is to explain how the optimal, that is the cost minimizing combinations of inputs, is chosen. And there is a certain schedule for the chapter here. First we will discuss this concept of cost. What are costs? And we should uh, further on explain how the characteristics of the firm's production technology affect these costs in the long and in the short run. And the main output of this chapter is to arrive at something referred to here as TC as a function of Q. TC means total costs. So we're kind of aiming for arguing at least that these total costs as a function of how much is produced is possible to find. I assume if you've had any courses in economics, you've seen these cost functions, okay? And are in many cases, they are just assumed that there is a cost function. But we need to do some kind of transformation here between these general inputs of capital and labor, which are combined in the production function to kind of get some cost function as a function of these Q, okay? This is kind of obvious, isn't it? If we produce more, it costs more. Okay, that's kind of what this is about. Okay, but uh, as we have kind of used the production function as some basic building block here, we need to make some logical structure relating that into our end result here, which is the total cost function. <sighs> what are costs? This is a kind of tricky thing. It's uh, not always easy to understand what costs are. Um, they have a defi definition here that kind of compare these two concepts of so economic cost versus accounting cost. Okay. And they say here that economic costs are costs related to exploitation of scarce resources. And then there is a parenthesis saying that accounting is related to the depreci dep depreci depreciation, for instance. You know what depreciation is? Have you heard that concept? Yeah, it's about the value of objects, okay? So if I buy a car for 100,000 Norwegian crowns, then after some time, it, uh, the value typically drops, okay? That's what's referred to as depreciation. So there are obviously two different concepts here of this, what we have to take into account if we do accounting. If we make accounts, write down numbers, then there are rules 
for instance, related to taxation, which we really don't need to bother with here. Okay, that's the point. So we, we can focus on a, a smaller subset of costs, which we refer to as economic costs, uh, in comparison to this accounting cost concept, which is kind of wider and has different applicability, so to speak. So, t t so this is kind of nice. Okay, we can kind of focus on what what the real costs are. If if I pay my my labor wages, of course, that is economic costs. Okay, this is a real cost for me. I have to pay it. Then there is a concept called opportunity cost. Do you know what that that means? That is actually it's an income. Uh, it's a kind of misleading concept. If you look at the explanation here, suppose there is a firm who owns a building. Of course, it doesn't pay anything for renting this building because it owns it. Should the cost be zero? It says here, the answer has, has here, no, you could lend it out for money, alternative or opportunity use. Okay, so even though it doesn't occur any costs here on these buildings, th there is a certain cost related to them, or actually an income in this case, because you, you could potentially rent it out to earn money. So this concept of opportunity cost is important in economic theory because it, uh, it tells us that uh, we cannot necessarily just observe the economic activity within inside the firm. Uh, it could be that in some cases we, we kind of need to, what could we actually use this for as an alternative to not to use it to what we use it today or to what we could have used it for if we don't use it at all, as in this case. I mean, the assumption is, of course, that the firm owns this building and it doesn't use it today. And then, of course, there is a, pos a possibility of renting it out. If you actually use it for something, of course, you can still you do the same argument. But in that case, you will have to ask a slightly more complex question. OK, I have this building. There is certain production taking place here. Maybe I can move that production into another building I could find space there that could perhaps have adverse effect on my productivity. So I produce less than I used before on the other and I get some rent or I can sell it, which produces capital. So you see there is some internal optimization going on here. Okay, You should kind of always look at these opportunities you have to produce a different cost structure. So I see that cost of labor wages is also opportunity cost. And finally, these textbooks kind of says that economic cost is opportunity cost. So the relevant cost element is to kind of look at opportunity cost. We are now in chapter 7, aren't we? Yeah. So what about this concept of sunk costs? Now we are, di we are discussing different cost concepts now, as you probably understand. A sunk cost is the exact opposite of an opportunity cost. It is defined as an expenditure or payment, if you like, made which cannot be recovered. We often refer to this as an irreversible cost. So what kind of cost could this be? On the event side, there is a lot of sunk costs, isn't it? If you build a football stadium, and have no football team, then maybe you can get a little bit back, but you can't get much back from this football stadium, can you? In South Africa, before, before the World Championships, there was built a lot of stadiums. I don't know whether these stadiums are used very much today. Maybe some of you know. I have the feeling that some of these stadiums are what are referred to as white elephants. Have you heard this term, white elephant? A white elephant is some kind of event stage which is built and just used once. And then it kind of stays back as this white elephant. Okay, it doesn't, it's not used for what is what meant to be used for. And white elephants are typically irreversible or sunk costs. You, can, can, you cannot reverse them back. You cannot get the cost back. Of course, you can get some, but typically not so much. A bridge which is built at some point is highly irreversible, re isn't it? Highly irreversible. You cannot, of course, you can take the bridge down, but it's very hard to sell this concrete for anything at all, okay? So it, it doesn't produce the amount of money you put into it. 
If you buy a car, for, for however, you can of course sell it the same day at perhaps not the same price, but not very different. Okay. If you buy a house, it could be very reversible. You can get it back even with a, at a higher price normally. So these are a special type of costs. Okay. And the important thing about this is point three here, as it is irreversible, it should not be taken into account regarding future economic decisions. Okay. So the statement below here is a wrong statement then. We have used so much money and resources on this project, it must be finished. That is wrong then, isn't it? There is no reason to finish a bad project because you have spent a lot of money on it, which you cannot reverse. Actually, that's a much better reason to stop it, isn't it? Unless you have very good forecasts that it will actually end in success. So arguments of the type, we have spent so much on this, it must be finished, are economically wrong. Okay, That's the meaning of these statements. That can never be sensible. This money is lost anyway. So there's no reason to continue losing more money, is it? The sooner you stop it, the better. Of course, as I said, it could be that some project managers come to you and say, oh, no, now we are in a good situation. Now we can finish this project. But you should be careful, of course. So some costs are not interesting to look at. Disregard them. Okay. But remember what they mean. Okay. It's uh, about e uh, how do you pronounce it? Irreversible. Is that correct, Eric? Okay, irreversible. I'm, I'm trying to say irreversible, but that's not correct. It's irreversible. Okay. The most uh, English words start starting with an I, you say I, don't you? <laughs> that was a slightly more difficult question. <laughs> we let Eric think a little bit about that in the soon, soon to come break. Okay, did you, did you get this point? This is an important point. Okay, some costs no meaning in uh, in uh, taking them into account and the point is that they cannot be recovered okay of course there is really no real sunk costs any money you put into something may give you something back but the, the main point here is that the difference is big okay you invest a lot in your bridge and if the road is put another on another hand of course you you won't use it and of course you can take it down there is some concrete here there is some iron and steel in it, maybe you can sell it, but of course the main cost here is the actual construction. And that labor cost is not reversible. So in general you should expect that activity which involves a lot of labor has a higher degree of irreversibility than activity which still can involve a lot of labor but at least produces physical objects because these fixed physical objects can be traded in the market. But an engineer working heavily constructing a certain object, that kind of work is very hard to reverse unless he makes an invention or some patents. Okay. So very labor intensive activity where you not only have labor to produce the product but you actually use people to produce the product itself like you do in sport in events, you should expect there is a lot of irreversible costs. Okay? If you rehearse a play, you can rehearse this play many hours, can't you? You can rehearse the singing, the dancing, the speaking for hours and hours and hours and hours. Of course, if it turns out that the play is not staged, then this money is lost, isn't it? You can't reverse it. Of course, you may have ta you maybe you have made some tapes on your rehearsals. Maybe you can sell that for a tiny amount of money. But the actual costs involved here cannot be reversed in most cases. So, so you should expect that much of the costs, or actually more of the costs, are irreversible in our setting, which is sport and events, than in other settings. This is an important point. Okay. So about fixed and variable costs. Fixed costs are often referred to, at least in these textbooks, as FC. So FC means fixed costs. It's just an abbreviation. 
So a fixed cost is a cost that does not vary with the level of output. In many cases, the labor cost is fixed, okay? You, at least in the very short run, okay? You have a certain amount of people, and these people, they can kind of either produce 10 units or 100 units, depending on, on what you do with them. And of course, you pay them their, their wages, so the cost doesn't really change here, whether they are kind of instructed to produce 10 units or 20 units. If you think about football players, they uh, normally do not or at least in some cases of course there are bonus schemes but uh, at least in Norway it's very seldom that you get paid per match okay so your salary doesn't really depend on how many matches you play of course to some extent if there is a maximum amount of matches played there could be a salary agreements that says that if you if you play so or so many matches within these boundaries you get less than if you play more but given that you, you kind of have a running team, y they kind of play the matches they are given, so to speak. And it's not necessarily such that their wages increase. Of course, <coughs> some of these matches may be into European Cups, or uh, so, and of course then you get extra paid. Uh, uh, if you think about uh, actors playing on a, a running show, of course they get more paid per show. So if you if you stage it 100 times, you get a certain salary. If you stage it 200 times, you get more salary. So that would not be a fixed cost. But actors playing in a film, they normally do not have royalty structures, meaning that if this movie is showed many times, of course they get a little bit more, but the main part of their income is actually at making the movie stage. So you see different structures here on fixed and variable costs in the event situation. Sometimes it's fixed, sometimes it's variable. Of course, a variable cost then is the exact, exact opposite, a cost that varies as output varies. <coughs> a typical cost that varies as output varies is raw material costs. Okay? If you produce cars, of course, the more cars you produce, the more steel you need, the more plastic you need, the more rubber you need, the more engines you need, all these kind of increases kind of linearly with the number of cars you produce. So raw material is, is, is a typical variable cost here. In some cases, labor also should be it, perhaps uh, to a greater extent in uh, classical manufacturing than perhaps in event production. Okay. Time for a break. Two minutes for questions, if you have any.